One of the things I learned very early on in these decades of research into all these various subjects around the world uh, is that nothing is as it seems. But the more deeply you go into it, you see that it goes much further than that. Not only is nothing what it seems, virtually everything, certainly everything of significance, is inverted. What it seems to be turns out to be the opposite of what it is. We live in an extraordinarily inverted society. And nowhere more does that apply to what is happening yet again in Israel-Palestine with a state-of-the-art weaponry being used to attack a virtually defenseless people in Gaza. The reason Israel is there at all is based on an historical claim that that land is the ancient home of today's Jewish people and that it was promised to them by God, the Old Testament God. And this is um, what was stated in the 1948 Declaration of the Establishment of the State of Israel. The land of Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here their spiritual, religious and political identity was shaped. Here they first attained statehood, created cultural values of national and universal significance and gave to the book, oh, gave to the world, the eternal book of books. Now, that, um, that uh, line that I mentioned earlier about everything being inverted, well, there's no greater example than that because that is historical bollocks. Today's Jewish people have absolutely no historic or genetic connection to the land today called Israel. And before anyone starts saying, he's anti-Semitic, um, here's a couple of books um, by Jewish writers and researchers. This uh, is The Thirteenth Tribe by uh, Arthur Kussler. It uh, came out in uh, 1976, I think it was. And here is a much more recent uh, book by Shlomo Sand, The Invention of the Jewish People. And uh, Shlomo uh, Sand is a, a professor of history at Tel Aviv University. And when you look at what they say, you look at what others who research the subject say, I've researched it myself, the conclusion is common and it is constant when you look at the facts. The Jewish people of today do not originate from the ancient land of Israel, but from a land, an empire in the Caucasus known once as Khazaria, home of the Khazars. And they almost certainly ended up there from ancient Sumer Babylon, what we now call Iraq, but you can certainly pick them up in Khazaria. And what happened was this. On one side of Khazaria was the Christian Empire. On the other side was the Muslim Empire. And the king of Khazaria, King Bulan, possibly to avoid being absorbed by either, had a mass conversion in 740 AD to Judaism. And the king of Khazaria was called the Kagan. And that is why Kagan is such a common Jewish name to this day. Also, when you, um, when you look at uh, what they call uh, the, 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 the Jewish nose, I mean, all races have got um, different genetic traits and, and people talk about you know, the, the Jewish nose or whatever. That is not a trait 
of Israel, the land of Israel, it is a trait of the Caucasus. And so what we're looking at is a situation in which a whole nation of people, the Palestinians, have had their land taken over on the basis of an absolute historical lie. Because what happened is when the Khazaria Empire broke up, not least through invasions from, from the East, Far East, the, those people, those people converted to Judaism, who became intergenerationally um, followers of Judaism, they moved north up into Lithuania, into Russia, into Poland. And then eventually they moved across into uh, Germany and Western Europe. And it was those people, by then known as Ashkenazi Jews, Ashkenazi Jews are the vast, vast, overwhelming majority of Jewish people today, um, straight from the Khazaria Empire. Um, they were the ones that were um, treated so uh, horrifically by Hitler and then moved to create the um, State of Israel in 1948 based on that historical lie and also many to um, America. And Arthur Kussler sums it up in his book, The Thirteenth Tribe, uh, when he says this, talking of this situation about the origins out of Khazaria. It would mean that their ancestors come not from the Jordan, but from the Volga, not from Canaan, but from the Caucasus, once believed to be the cradle of the Aryan race. That's what we get the term Caucasian from, used for white people in America. And that genetically, Costa says, they are more closely connected to the Hun, Uyghur, and Magar tribes than to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Should this turn out to be the case, he says, and it does, and you've got to look at other people's research like Shlomo Sand, etc. Should this turn out to be the case, then the term anti-Semitism would be void of meaning, based on a misapprehension uh, shared by both the killers and their victims. The story of the Khazar Empire, as it slowly emerges from the past, begins to look like the most cruel hoax which history has ever perpetrated. And on that cruel hoax has come all that has followed. I'm going to go into the implications of that today because it's, it's got massive implications for what's happening as, um, as I speak. And that... Uh, mention there of anti-Semitism is another one of those inversion because the Khazars were not Semitic people. The term Semitic doesn't refer to a race it refers to a language group and that language group overwhelmingly consists of peoples and nations wait for it that today we now call Arab. So the Semitic races are the Arab races. And yet to challenge the horrific um, actions of Israel or to challenge the manipulations of the House of Rothschild and Henry Kissinger and all these people, you get called anti-Semitic, which again, is a laughable inversion of the truth and the way things really are. So let's um, let's work our way through the um, the story. Shlomo Sand not only wrote a book about the invention of the Jewish people; he wrote one more recently, two thousand thirteen. Um, about the invention of the land of Israel. And uh, he uh, questions whether there ever was this 
Jewish, ancient Jewish nation at all. And when you think about it, it's all based on ancient texts and biblical texts um, written by who knows who, who knows when, in who knows what circumstances. And based on the fact that, that some God, some angry, vicious, bloodthirsty God of the Old Testament decided to award to Abraham and, and all his successors and, and, and what have you, the land of Israel. Now, even if you follow the biblical texts, then it wasn't a land that was theirs from the start. They colonized it. You know, the, the whole story of Moses and going into the, the, the promised land, they colonized it with God, you know, on the sidelines, cheering them on, saying, kill them all, slaughter them, I don't care who it is, men, women, children, anything, kill them. And of course, that mentality still prevails when you look at current uh, events. And the story of the Khazar origins of today's Jewish people. And those that haven't you know, read my books or read these books will be um, very surprised at this, I'm sure. But for a long, long time, that was a legitimate or considered a legitimate part of Jewish historical research. And then suddenly the lid was put on it and it was suppressed so that um, it became uh, ridiculed. You were attacked if you uh, went there. And there was a systematic effort to um, wipe the truth of today's Jewish origins uh, in Khazaria out of um, mainstream uh, history. In fact, um, let me read you a little uh, a quote here from Shlomo Sands' uh, book, The Invention of the Jewish People. He says here, from 1951 to the present moment, not a single historical work about the Khazars has appeared in Hebrew. Nor was Pollock's Khazaria ever reissued. It served till the end of the 1950s as a legitimate point of departure for Israeli researchers, but it lost its status over the years systematically, for reasons I'll come to. Except for one modest MA thesis on this subject and one published routine seminar paper, there has been nothing. The Israeli academic world has been mute on this topic. Uh, no significant research has taken place. Slowly and consistently, any mention of the Khazars in the public arena in Israel, um, or any, anywhere else mostly, uh, came to be tagged as eccentric, freakish, and even menacing. And that is the classic way they discredit truth and discredit those that communicate uh, truth. So what was behind this suppression of the true history of Jewish people? Well, it was the house of Rothschild, overwhelmingly, and their creation, Zionism, or Rothschild Zionism, as I call it, to constantly emphasize and underpin the true creators and controllers of what we call Zionism today. Because Rothschild Zionism has worked to make itself an interchangeable term with Jewish people. So if you challenge Zionism, you're anti-Semitic. Well, you're not for reasons I've explained, but you're anti-Jewish. When um, large numbers of Jewish people um, oppose Zionism, some of them vehemently. And the manipulation of information uh, led the Zionist conspiracy to a produce a fake history or emphasize a fake history of Jewish people today 
and to suppress the true history. And Zionism is not about race. It's not about race. It's a political, in its play out in the public arena um, expression. It is merely a political movement that supports a homeland for Jewish people in Israel. But at its core, this is the point, at its core, its inner core, its Rothschild core, it is a secret society. A secret society that locks into the rest of the web um, and moves as one unit towards this global tyranny I'm exposing. And so when you see um, 2%, less than 2% of American people um, are Jewish. Significantly less than that number will actually be Zionists and supporters of Zionism. And a heck of a lot less than that number will be attached to the secret society level of Rothschild Zionism. And yet, if you look at look in my books, the ratio of Rothschild Zionists to positions of significant power in the United States over a long period of time, not least around surrounding uh, before, during and after 9-11, um, is absolutely fantastic. These people at that level are not representatives of Jewish people. They, they have contempt for Jewish people in general. They are agents of the secret society with its um, uh, global agenda. Now, Zionism began in um, the late 1800s, the late 19th century, uh, with the first Zionist conference in Baal, Switzerland, um, chaired by Theodore Herzl, the founder of the Zionist movement, although, you know, he's a, he was a, um, just a front man, a yes man, a gopher for the uh, uh, Rothschilds. Now, it was in Baal, Switzerland. But what they don't tell you, well, I'll tell you, it was supposed to be originally held, that first Zionist conference, in um, Munich, Germany. But that could not happen because of the vehement opposition of Jews in Germany to the idea that they were going to be shipped out and moved to Israel, which is what Zionism wanted. And so when events moved forward and we had the horrors of Nazi Germany, which I say the Rothschilds were fundamentally behind, by the way, suddenly people were moving out of Germany for obvious reasons to Israel and um, to the United States. So let's take the story forward. You had Zionism, modern Zionism, created in the late 19th century. And a few years later came the First World War. And um, we had Germany um, going walkabout and the other nations of Europe uh, responding to that. And we had this world war and uh, the Americans were brought in uh, eventually. And the Americans um, came in because of uh, deals done in the background, which involved something called the Balfour Declaration. In other words, the Americans will come in with the Rothschilds manipulating in the background, but for that to happen, we want this. And what it was, was a declaration by the British Foreign Secretary called um, Arthur Balfour. And when you hear something like the Balfour Declaration, you would think that he would stand up in the Houses of Parliament or make a speech somewhere and make this declaration. It actually wasn't. It was a letter. And it was a letter sent um, by Lord Balfour, the Foreign Secretary, to Baron Rothschild, Walter Rothschild, second Baron Rothschild. They love their bloody titles, these people. Um, and 
This is what it said. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this project. This is part of that deal I was talking about. Um, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done. This is, this is a sick joke now that nothing shall be done, which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and the political status enjoyed by Jews in any other um, country. So there you have um, on November the 2nd, 1917, the Balfour Declaration, which given the, the power of Britain, the empire and all that stuff in those days was, was a massive step forward towards bringing about a Jewish homeland. So clearly when you are justifying this on an historical um, fake, i.e. it's the ancient land of today's Jewish people, you have got to suppress the truth about the origins of um, Khazaria. And so more and more that was suppressed as, as Slomo Sanders um, explained. Then after the First World War, all that horror, all that death, all that slaughter, came the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919. And as I explain in my books, the major representatives of each country um, and advisors um, for each of the major players, Britain, uh, United States, France, etc., at the Versailles Peace Conference were Rothschild frontmen, um, big time. And they declared their support for a homeland in Israel. We're now moving along here. But there were uh, still uh, problems um, and hurdles to be overcome, not least of which uh, so many Jewish people in Germany wanted nothing to do with it. They were fine, thank you, don't need that. And for Israel to be established, it needed lots of um, Jewish people to justify its existence. So along came World War II with the rise of the Nazis and Adolf Hitler. And there's no question uh, it's documentable, uh, documentable fact that the Nazis were funded by um, Rothschild connected families like the Rockefellers in America. I mean, the Rockefellers um, were, were funding um, Hitler's race purity movement. They, they, they funded a whole floor of a university to allow a, 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 the, the Hitler's race purity expert, uh, Ernst Rudin, to, um, to do his work. So it, 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 the Nazis in Germany were created um, not just within Germany, but externally through the um, Rothschild networks and the Rockefellers and people like this. All documentable fact, you know, with the, with the Rockefellers, etc. And so he then turns on Jewish people and starts again going walkabout, as in the First World War, and other countries responded, and we had World War II. We also had uh, the concentration camps and the horrific. Um, treatment of Jew Jewish people in Germany and, and other people too, like communists and, and uh, disabled people, other people that the Nazis didn't like. And then as a result of that horrific treatment in Germany, and you know, I said earlier, they couldn't give a damn, this, this inner um, secret society level of Rothschild Zionism couldn't give a damn about Jewish people in general. They're just pawns in their game, like everyone else's. And because that, that horrific treatment led to a, a, an outpouring of um, kind of horror. And from that came the pressure to allow the homeland in Israel based on this historical lie. And so the movement began and there was a whole nation of people there at the time, Palestinians. And it turns my stomach when I see Israeli politicians and leaders condemning terrorism and we only want peace. Israel has never wanted peace at the level of the, the regime. 
because um, it's always done the opposite. And when uh, the the Jewish people started arriving in numbers because Jewish people had lived in Palestine for a long time and, and they, they got fantastic with um, the, the Palestinian people. And in fact, the, the, some of the most uh, vehement opposers of this mass influx of Jewish people out of Germany um, and elsewhere were Jewish people already lived there because they, they their lifestyle and, and, and the um, their way of life and their interaction with the Palestinians all also went up in smoke, literally, often. And the Jewish leadership that established itself in Germany, and all of them answerable to, uh, in Israel, all of, all of them answerable to uh, the Rothschilds, then created um, terrorist groups like Ergun and the Stern Gang, um, and they started uh, doing horrific terrorist acts to terrify the Palestinian population. And in the end, their grotesque actions led to something like 800,000 Palestinian people leaving their homeland in terror at the terrorism of the Jewish regime that was establishing itself in, in Israel. And you had people like who became prime ministers, like um, Menachem Begin, Yitzhak, Shamir and others, they were operatives in these terrorist groups who then went on to be prime minister and condemned the terrorism uh, of others. Extraordinary hypocrisy. So what we then had um, was the establishment of, of Israel in, in part of Palestine, but that was never how it was meant uh, to end. It was going to be a, a a process of constant acquisition until they had the bloody lot and, and indeed created this greater um, uh, Israel, which um, it, it is claimed the, um, that God, the Old Testament God again, gave to Abraham from the river in Egypt, the Nile, across to the Euphrates in uh, what is now Iraq. And, and that includes parts of Syria, obviously parts of Iraq, um, and uh, Jordan and, and other countries. And we're seeing that unfolding, this, this progressive, uh, progressive um, acquisition. So one of the, the means that's been used has been to entice or manipulate attempted invasions of Israel. Because thanks to the United States and not least Britain as well, they have vast um, superiority in weaponry, in the military. And so when there have been invasions, the, or attempted invasions, the, the great um, superiority of the Israeli military has pushed it all back, back into those countries, and then they've, they've kept it. And so we had the, um, the realigning of what constituted um, Israel at the time of the 1967 war and then others. And then we've had the, again, progressive takeover of uh, lands which uh, the Israeli regime is occupying against um, international law, where well, they can do anything they really like, um, because the Rothschilds control Israel and the Rothschilds control America and the Rothschilds control Britain and the Rothschilds control the UN. So, you know, uh, anything goes. Um, what would be roundly condemned in any other country, um, uh, like, like Iran, is just excused when Israel did. They're just defending themselves by, yeah, by slaughtering civilians. Yeah, okay. So progressively, the so-called settlements have taken more and more and more and more land. And when you see now um, what is left of Palestinian land, it is pathetic compared with what the situation was in um, even 1948, when the State of Israel was established. And so what we're seeing in current times 
is the continuation of this progression. And if people are going to be streetwise to see what's going on, they have to loosen their, their focus and their obsession with sides, with black and white sides. That's not how it works. If you want to control a football match, in other words, you want to control a situation, if you control one side, you're not going to control the football match or the situation. You're going to, you're going to influence it, yes, but you're not going to control it because there's another side you don't influence or control. And so the game is to control and manipulate through the other side as well. And through, you know, the UN and the United States also control the referee of the game and bring about the circumstances you want. So just because you've got a group like ISIS that's been taking over large chunks of um, Iraq and is, is fighting the Syrian regime of Assad, all of which is absolutely in line with um, Israel's long-term goals of acquiring all that land. Um, just because they call themselves um, Muslim fanatics doesn't mean that at the core they might be controlled by something else. They are, and they're controlled from the United States, and if they're controlled from the United States, they're controlled from, from Israel. Um, and that doesn't mean that every one of these lunatics with their, with their, with their guns and their black flags um, is uh, in on the game. Most of them are not. They don't have to be. You get a fanatic who, who hasn't got two brain cells to rub together, and, and you wind them up, and you tell them it's about jihad, and it's about you know, fighting for, for Allah and God and all that bloody nonsense. And they'll go and do your bidding, believing that's why they're doing it. But at the core, they're not you know, doing it for that reason um, at all. And it's always been interesting to me when I have watched circumstances progress in uh, the Middle East and, and, and Israel, many times now, to the point where um, you know that it's building up to Israel doing another invasion or attack job on Gaza, because they just want to destroy that place. I mean, that, that, that's an open air prison camp, open air concentration camp, basically. But when you see the progression of events and you think, hey, you go, Israel wants to um, have another go at Gaza. Every time, every time, rockets, pop gun rockets compared with what Israel has, yes, but rockets start getting fired out of Gaza at Egypt, uh, sorry, at, at Israel. And that gives, um, the Israeli regime, the opportunity every time to justify going in and blowing the shit out of the um, civilian population. And I was, um, I was looking through um, a book of mine called Remember Who You Are um, the other day. And a certain passage that I, I wrote in it, it's um, two, two years or so, two, three years or so now since this book came out. And given current events, it's quite uh, prophetic when you see um, some of the information here that I'll read to you now. Remember, this was, this was years ago, but this is the pattern that is now being repeated in current times. Because if you want to control the game, you've got to control both sides, or however many sides there are in it. Okay, uh, the book says this. One of the main ways that the Israelis stall on any agreement, uh, the peace agreement I'm talking about, with, with the Palestinians, is by saying they can't negotiate with the elected Palestinian government because it is a terrorist organization known as Hamas. And they're now saying Hamas is behind all these rockets. We must stop Hamas. Hey, so it goes on. Well, how funny. Israel created Hamas as a bogeyman that could give them the excuse not to negotiate and so have more time to finish the job of Palestinian genocide. 
The other bogeyman at that time, um, re-emerging in the Middle East to frighten people, is called the Muslim Brotherhood, um, which was involved in the People's Revolution, the original one, in uh, Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood has an interesting background too. Britain and America established um, the Muslim Brotherhood after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1924. And they are still controlled by the same crowd to this day, although the Brotherhood has also served the interests of the Nazis, Israelis, Russians, French and Germans over the years. Israel is now among the major sponsors of the Muslim Brotherhood, which was involved in the founding of Hamas. Robert Dreyfus, the author of Devil's Game, How the United States Helped Unleash Fundamentalist Islam, wrote, Beginning in 1967 and through to the late 1980s, Israel helped the Muslim Brotherhood establish itself in the occupied territories. Um, it assisted Ahmed Yassin, the leader of the Brotherhood, in creating a mass, betting that its Islamist character would weaken the PLO. The PLO was the Palestinian Liberation Organization of Yasser Arafat, which was the main um, representative group of Palestinians uh, at that time. The PLO was, uh, like it says here, the most prominent official representative of Palestinian interests. Dreyfus also pointed out that during the 1980s, the Muslim Brotherhood in Gaza and the West Bank did not support resistance to the Israeli op occupation. Most of its energy went to fighting the PLO, especially its more left-wing factions on university campuses. Charles Freeman, the one-time American ambassador to Saudi Arabia, said this, Israel started Hamas. It was a project of Shin Bet, that's Israel's internal um, intelligence agency, um, which had a feeling that they could use it to um, hem in the PLO. David Shipler, a reporter on the New York Times, quotes the Israeli military governor of Gaza as saying that Israel financed Islamic fundamentalists to oppose the PLO. And this is what uh, Shipper said. Politically speaking, Islamic um, fundamentalists were sometimes regarded as useful to Israel because they had conflicts with the secular supporters of the PLO. Violence between the two groups erupted occasionally on West Bank University campuses, divide and rule, divide and rule. Israeli military uh, governor of the Gaza Strip, Brigadier General Yitzhak uh, Segev, once told me how he had financed the Islamic movement as a counterweight to the PLO and the communists. The Israeli government gave me a budget and the military government gives it to the mosques, he said. And Yasser Arafat, the um, head of the PLO, told um, an Italian newspaper, Hamas is a creation of Israel which at the time of Prime Minister Shamir, brackets terrorist, um, gave them money and more than 700 institutions, among them schools, universities and mosques. Arafat said that the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak uh, Rabin had told him in the presence of Egypt's President Mubarak that Israel had supported Hamas. It goes like this, uh, it says this is in the book, um, every time there is any chance of a peace agreement, which would commit Israel to an outcome that it doesn't want, Hamas or the Muslim Brotherhood carry out a terrorist attack, or Mossad does, the Israeli uh, intelligence arm, military intelligence arm. And this is used as the excuse to end negotiations. Uh, Israel orders its agents in Hamas to start firing the military equivalent of peace shooters at um, Israel to justify the state-of-the-art bombing and mass murder of Palestinians in retaliation. Hamas representatives who won't play ball of it or with Israel are the ones that are targeted. Now, I mean, look at that line. Um, Israel orders its agents in Hamas to start firing the military equivalent of of Israel to justify state of the art bombing and mass murder of Palestinians and, uh, in retaliation. This was written some years ago, and we're seeing it repeated again now. It's so important that people do not see the world in black and white. It's not like that. It, you're meant to see it like that. That's, that, that's the way it's, um, it's presented, but that's not how it is. And just because um, people call themselves one thing doesn't mean they're not working for 
that which they say um, they oppose. And we, um, oh dear, I'm sweating today. It's a really hot day in here. Yeah. If you're around the world, it's been a really hot uh, week in England and um, it's, um, it's boiling in it. Anyway, one of the things that um, has come out in the last uh, few days is that this, this idea of um, the suggested ceasefire, which was supposedly brokered by Egypt and agreed to by Israel, and that the, the claim is that Hamas wouldn't uh, play ball and therefore the fact that, that um, Palestine civilians go on getting killed by Israeli um, weaponry uh, is the fault of Hamas because they could have had a ceasefire. Well, when you look at the background to that, that's another inversion. And guess who was involved? Guess who was involved in brokering and bringing about that um, alleged ceasefire offer? Only Tony Blair, the Middle East envoy, um, supposedly neutral, but actually the Middle East envoy to Israel. And anything that Blair's involved in, anything that Netanyahu's involved in, and then we've got this di dictator, what's his name, Al-Sisi, or whatever his bloody name is in, in, in Egypt, this military dictator, anything any of them are bloody involved in is a scam. And what was happening is that people have been so sickened by the killing of Palestinian civilians and children in this um, manufactured attack on Gaza, the latest, that Israel were big time losing the, the, the public opinion, what they call the propaganda war. And they had to find a way around that. So they manipulated this alleged offer of a ceasefire, um, which almost certainly was not communicated to Hamas. Uh, and the whole thing was meant to fail because now and you, you'll hear these Israeli leaders going on now. Now they're saying, oh, well, they, they could have stopped it, but, but we offered, but they, they, they kept firing their pop guns and, and, and we've got to go back with state of the art weaponry to defend ourselves. Uh, so it's all a game. And it's a game that has been going on all this time. And fundamental to it has been to maintain the lie of justification. Staggering as it seems when you've got a brain that's actually on active duty. That Israel as a homeland for the Jews is justified because God gave it to them according to some texts, no one knows where it came from. And to maintain that lie, the truth about the real origins in Khazaria have to be um, suppressed. The world is indeed inverted wherever you look. But we are where we are. And although the founding of Israel has been based on a lie, all those Israelis are there now. And a, a lot of them are opposing the war uh, and the slaughter and the attacks on Gaza. A lot of them aren't, but a lot of them are. And so we are where we are. And the only way of solving this is for justice to be done. For Palestinians to be given a right to self-determination to be given the land back that has been stolen by Israel and, and is being um, built upon um, with these settlers more and more so that it, it becomes more and more uh, irreversible. But it doesn't. Get them off. Get them out. They knew that they were building on stolen land. It wasn't theirs. Um, and Israelis and Palestinians need to live in, decide to live in peace with equal rights and equal statehood. That's, that's the only way out of this mess that's been created by this gigantic hoax. But that's not what those behind the hoax want. They want to take over that whole area of land. 
they are the ones behind the um, attempts to remove Assad in Syria. They were the ones behind the invasion of Iraq. It's created all that mayhem and allowed this ISIS to come in because of the circumstances they created. They're the ones that went into Libya and uh, turned it into uh, the Stone Age uh, compared with what it was. They are mad and they are the ones that want Iran. And when you think that the whole deal in relation to Israel, you know, 